It's good to have Dr. Charlie Weir with us today. Dr. Charlie is a pastor at Gateway Church in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, I refer to him as Charlie. So we're going to do a first name basis on, in this conversation. Um, uh, Charlie, it's good to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, about what you're doing, your church planning at Gateway. Just tell us what you like the students to know about yourself. Um, well, I usually lead with I'm from New Jersey because not many people get to say that. Um, <laughs> so I'm from New Jersey. I've lived most of my adult life in the Southeast after going to, going to school in the Southeast. Um, married a, a Georgia girl, so... Uh, I'm, I'm fully acclimated here to the Southeast, I guess, but New Jersey explains some of my um, quirks and my personality, so I like to get that out there. Uh, I think I was one of the oldest uh, known church planters, um, left 13 years of ministry at Mount Perrin North Church of uh, God under Dr. First Paul Walker and then Dr. Mark Walker, which probably did more to shape me and prepare me for planting than than probably anything else. Um, but I was 42 uh, when I left Mount Perrin to plant Gateway and um, coming up on 57 now. Um, church planting has been the hardest, best thing that Jean and I have ever done. Our daughter's 23. We moved here when she was eight and she still loves the local church. Just graduated from Lee and um, stepped into serving uh, students and um, one of our sponsors for Buy a Tree, Change a Life, which is a big project we do every year. So I consider it a win that we planted a church and my daughter still likes the local church. So, Amen. yeah. I need to let everybody know that uh, Charlie and I have a history and that uh, I attend the Gateway, but my kids live in the Franklin area. I consider Gateway my home church. And I have told him this, and I'll be happy to tell the students this, that Charlie is a uh, consistently one of the best preachers I've ever heard. Um, and uh, that's why I wanted him to be here with us today. Um, Charlie, you planted Gateway 13 years ago. Um, I, I remember when I first started attending, you were moving from schoolhouse to schoolhouse. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to be interested, um, again, because I do believe that you're consistently one of the best preachers I've heard. How do you believe that your preaching has formed or shaped the vision at Gateway, beginning with a church plant to where you are now? So, so one, having a very specific vision of what you're, what you're after is important. And it, it has to be a little bit deeper than I want to see people saved and people discipled. Um, that's something we all carry with us. Um, so, so let me add to that then. When we were, were early on, I remember um, small groups was still all the rage. and. Um, I have a very close pastor friend in Augusta, Georgia, and I was talking with him about, man, we need to launch small groups. And by that time, we we're probably still were about 100 people. And he said, Charlie, you don't need to launch small groups. I said, why? He said, you are a small group. And um, so since that's the case, what, what is the primary way to give vision? Pulpit. But if you stand up and just preach your vision, after a while, People don't give a rip, right? That's what I try to teach all church planters when I look at their, their PR material. Their PR material mostly has everything to do with them and nothing to do about the community. And I understand that the church planter goes to, to help transform the community, but what they have to understand most of all is the community is completely disinterested in you. They're not interested in your success. They're not interested in who you are. They're not interested in your background, your education, or anything. They're not interested. What they're interested in is themselves. And that's the lost community we're called to. A lost community is interested in themselves. So what you have to do is you have to, you have to help convince them that you have something they need. And that's becoming increasingly more difficult in culture. Um, so when you preach, you have to preach to, to felt needs, but you have to do so in a manner that brings them back around to vision. Gateway's very specific vision is to develop people of spiritual influence. Are, are, you know, that is not incongruent with making disciples, being a disciple maker. I just frame it in a manner that that ordinary person can get. They can understand influence. They can understand their sphere. Um, and I try to say that the closer we are to Christ, the more discipled we are, the more spiritually influential we'll be. 
Well, you, you got to be able to communicate that in the arena that you have the most influence over, and that's the pulpit. The pulpit, ha to me still, is the most influential location I have for ministry. Now, you can argue it's not the most effective. You, you, you can argue that me sitting across a breakfast table is maybe the most effective. But what I would say is I don't get to the breakfast table without the pulpit. Something happens in the pulpit, the pulpit and the, that anointing and that preparation and that prayer that opens doors and windows and minds and hearts that would not be open otherwise, that allows that person to say, will you have breakfast with me? And then it's at breakfast, I'm able to make much more clearer lines to what I said and where they are. But I think it still, it starts for me anyway, it starts and ends with what happens um, in the pulpit. I'm interested, you, you, you talked about, and I think you're correct, uh, that the local community, when you're doing a church plant, they really don't care about the church, they don't care about the pastor, they care about themselves. How did you find yourself articulating that in messages, being faithful to the gospel, but a way of articulating that in the early days of Gateway uh, in a way that uh, calls the people to catch the vision? Yeah, yeah, really, really good question. Um, so this is specific to me, but the John 10 passage, um, the John 10 passage to me has been, I mean, I go back to my master's thesis from School of Theology. And when we were, had to write our, our philosophy of ministry, and I, you know, I had heard that in college and stuff, but I never dug deep like I had to you know, to finish up my D men. And for me, it boiled down to good shepherd. Like, like I, I, I mean, some people lead really well, right? Mm -hmm. Some people preach really well. I mean, I get there's different facets, but for me, for some reason, the hook was shepherd. And so it's one of your questions coming up though. It's, I think that I, I even shepherd through preaching. So, so shepherding is, is the key for me all along. So in that passage, the promise is a life more and better than you ever dreamed of, out of the message. So that was always then my hook. Is your life what you thought it would be? And most people that's lived any kind of life, like years-wise, will answer that question honestly and say, no. The highest percentage of people say, it's really not what I thought it was going to be. It's definitely not as smooth or as easy or as successful as I thought it was going to be. So I kind of start there. Okay, if it's not, then how can it be? If that's that's the promise we have. How can it be? I boiled it down to three things. Because um, I had to define, if I felt called to develop people's spiritual influence, I had to define what spiritual influence was. And then I had to dig down to figure out, well, then how do you go about making someone spiritually influential? It can't be, very, it can't be nebulous, because after a while, people aren't going to hang with you long. So in my doctoral it wouldn't be a thesis for a D man. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what it was called or what it's project, called. Project, okay. project. So, so, so my, from a D man project, D man project was why aren't more people involved in evangelism and why aren't they better at it? And the conclusion I came to is there's not a fresh enough connection to Christ. If something happened to our life a long time ago, but that's about it. And so there's really nothing new or fresh to share. Um, the second is we have a tendency to do life much more on our own than in community. Um, and so I don't have anybody to help shake me. The, th the third is life is so daggum hard that I have a tendency to walk with my eyes down, making sure I don't trip over anything, then my eyes up to see who's around me. So the way I framed that, though, is I didn't make a traditional mission statement. It's six words, fresh starts, great friends, real purpose. And I wasn't trying to be clever. What I was trying to do was create something. If someone asked me in the two minute eleva elevator conversation, why does your church exist? Why did you plant a church here in Franklin? Because I got asked that. Nashville and Charleston, South Carolina have more churches per capita than any two cities in America. There are more churches in Nashville than McDonald's. So, so you, have to, you have to be prepared to answer the question, right? Why another church? But when we moved here, there were more banks being put on corners than you could count. So my response was, 
does the area need another bank? And so the answer has to be obviously yes, or these corporations wouldn't be spending money buying prime real estate on the corner of roads, building banks, which means there were more people being more people needing bank service than there were banks. And you can flat out argue that all day long. There are more people who need Jesus than there are churches to disciple them. But my vision can't be, I want to disciple you. So, so when we phrase it as Fresh Start's Great Friends Real Purpose, and I sit across from breakfast with you, Dan, and you're a general businessman with two kids, and you got a mortgage and two car payments, and you, your college is staring you in the face, you go, who doesn't want a fresh start? Who doesn't want a do-over? Second is I can ask 100 people, how are your friendships? Do you have enough friendships, and are your friendships great? And the answer is going to be, no, my friendships are horrible. I got this one guy and we might talk about, right? And then you ask, you know, about real purpose. Do you really feel fulfilled in what you're doing? And a lot of times it's going to be no. So, so those six words can fit anybody. Now, now if I'm talking to Dan, the, the seminary professor, you know, I say, Dan, if we, we have to have a fresh ongoing relationship with Christ, if we're going to live fresh and because the culture smells stale a mile away and unless we're living in a fresh encounter with God, no one's going to be interested in anything we have to offer them. Second, great friends. Well, when I boil it down to a seminary professor, I'm saying we need community. Iron sharpens iron. Everybody will quote it, but they refuse to believe or they forget that when iron hits iron, it hurts. Yep. And we don't know how to do community. We can build right across the street. You've seen it. Live, work, play neighborhood. We long for community. But we host all of those community meetings at our church. Every one of their homeowners meetings, we host. And I sit in them. And those people are mean to one another. <laughs> They're mean to one another. They're mean to the management company. We want community. We think we're buying into Heck, they're spending half a million dollars and more to live in that community. And they don't know how to get along with one another. All right. We, we don't understand that community is, I'm going to mess up, and I'm going to disappoint you, and you're going to mess up, and you're going to disappoint me. But unless we learn to work through that biblically, we cannot say that we've experienced the love of God. So we've got to love our brother. We've got, we've got to hammer through that. Then the last point, just real purpose. Now, as a believer, I'm going to say we all have the same calling, but we all have different arenas because we're wired differently. The dentist is wired differently than the pipe fitter. The stay-at-home mom is wired differently than the professional mom. But every single one of us, even though we're in different arenas, we have the same calling, we have the same purpose. And so when you preach, I've got to be able to bring those things back out pretty consistently. It's not all about just preaching a series on vision, which I do every single year. I frame it in a different fashion. It's all vision. But you've got to be able to circle back where people start hearing those six words and equating them. Oh, he just preached this, but he was also saying this. So your vision statement, those six words, then form the, um, the meat, the center of your preaching when it comes to developing Christian community and, and individual formation. Yeah, they're not always like, they're not always straight lines, you know, a lot of times they're, they're, they're a kind of connect, connect the dot kind of situation. But if I'm trying to develop people's spiritual influence, and I believe those three elements are what make you spiritually influential, then I've got to preach those three things. So uh, I'm working on a, this is just a weird thing, okay, so I'm working on a series idea called small talk. And I just had to Google it but the shortest books in the Bible. Okay, what are the shortest books about? So I guarantee you, let's see, it's second and third John. I wrote up my blotter here. That's why I'm looking. Philemon, Obadiah, Jude. That's the, that's the five shortest. Then it goes Titus, second Thessalonians, Haggai, Nahum, and Jonah. Well, I haven't preached out of half of those books. Right, so part of discipleship and fresh starts is I've got to cover the whole counsel of God. So... I'm going to frame a series I'm calling small talk and I'm going to take a Sunday and preach out of those, you know, five Sundays out of these five shortest books. But all of it in the back of my mind is this goes to help people stay fresh and see the value 
the real time right now value of the word of God in their lives. So See, that, that's our main, one of our main responsibilities as pastors and preachers. How, how do we demonstrate through our preaching that the word of God is living viable for right now, yesterday, tomorrow, and we have to convey that in preaching? I have to say, and again, you, you're very, very good, and I think it's why I consider you one of my favorite preachers. You do really good biblical exposition. Um, you do have some theological meat. I remember um, one sermon in particular, you really kind of fleshed out one of the Reformation creeds and talked about that in a, in a really powerful way. But then the, I think that the strength is that you do that biblical exposition, you have some theological depth, but in the end, you have some really good life application. Um, you're able to bring this down to the level that people understand this is the way they live their lives. Um, and so I want to move, you kind of segued into it, talking about developing this new series, Small Talk. Um, how do you go about planning your preaching through the year? Uh, do you do it year annually? Do you do it quarterly? What is your process in developing your sermon series? So I'll, I'll talk to the church planter first and then to the seasoned pastor. Um, church planter, you're keeping your head above water. So when we first started, I, I probably, I was in a series and I might have known what my next series was. Um, here, here's what preaching in series is, because sometimes it's a matter of discussion. Here's what it does for me. The hardest part about preaching to me, to, to this culture audience, is creativity. It, it's not difficult for me to pick up the Bible, walk on a Sunday morning, and open up, read six verses of scripture, and talk off the top of my head for 25 minutes about it. That, right. that, that's not difficult. What's difficult is creatively framing it to make them go, I need to hear that. Because the days of them just, people just coming because the, you're there, do no. not, let me, let me tell you this, not only does it not exist, it does exist for some people, but not the people I'm trying to reach, right? Those people that are showing up are time, I'm trying to motivate them to do what I'm doing. I'm kind of trying to link arms with those people to say, hey, listen, you know, we get it. You and I get it. We get what worship is. We get the value of this together. So help me share this message. But for the people popping in once every three weeks, once every four weeks, twice every five weeks, um, I haven't got them to that place yet. So the creativity matters to get them there. So it either has to be creatively like, wow, I didn't think about that. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what he's going to say about that to, oh, well, that hits me straight in my face. I need to show up. All right. So as a church planter, um, the creative, coming up that creative energy is hard to come by because you're doing everything else. So when I can lock into a series, what basically I've done is I've spent enough time around that four to six week series that I've, I've got a nice graphic. Um, I've got my kind of taglines with it. I know generally what I'm trying to communicate over these four to six weeks in four to six different ways. And my preparation is easier because I can eliminate the creative side out of that. Now I'm really getting into biblical exposition and application. When I first started planning Gateway, I probably only stayed one series ahead. About four or five years ago, um, uh, Jason Isaacs, I think, um, pastor and denomination kind of sent out this spreadsheet he had developed and if anybody wanted to adapt it. And now I saw, I said, oh, wait a minute. I can actually start trying to plan this out annually. But this is what it looks like for me. Through the course of the year, I'll get an idea of a sermon, a sermon series idea. And I'll put it in my phone or I keep a journal and I'll just jot it in the journal. And I keep a running tab of those things. When I get to the end of the year, because I just finished one, I get to the end of the year, I look at what did I get to, what didn't I get to? What gaps do I have, what gaps do I don't have? Where, what, are my, what are my new title lists? And then I open up this spreadsheet and there are some natural things you gotta work in there, right? So um, the summer, school breaks, um, the beginning of the year, you're, you know, people wanna hear different things end of the year, but I've kind of got it down. I, we do Advent every year. So I know four Sundays in December, I've got Advent. I've preached every, I think I've preached every angle of hope, love, joy, peace, light there is. Um, 
I've done it through movies. I've done it through uh, old, you know, Christmas carols. I've done it every way possible, but I love it every year. But this year, actually, I divided it up among my staff. And I said, okay, listen, I've, I'm going to do my favorite. You were there for that one. I said, I'm going to do Hope. Hope's my favorite. I'm going to do that one. Who wants to do the other ones? Um, the summer, I do a book study. I've done book studies for I don't know how long. Um, and eight weeks, it's a book study. What it allows me to do is I can assign passages to my staff. You know, one of my favorites was we did uh, Matthew, King of Kings. And it was, how does Matthew demonstrate that Jesus is the king? Let's preach through the book, understanding who the audience is and why Matthew wrote it. Because that makes a difference how you hear it. So I outlined all that to the staff and I started signing passages. That helps. Um, so that, that's kind of really how I do it. I, I, you know, this year was, the theme was stronger and I was convinced that I need to preach less for more. And too many times preaching is we introduce, um, we introduce subject, we introduce the drama of the subject and then we solve the subject, right? So we have to, we have to create the tension um, and then we solve the tension. And that gets very tiring every single week. So I said, all right, well, we're going to talk about families. We're going to talk about how to make our family stronger. And we're going to talk about it four straight weeks. We're going to talk about how to make the church stronger. We do it every four weeks. Gonna, you know, and so I did that all year long until the, the pandemic really blew up. And then I started reviewing that. And I said, no, we're still going to stay with it. So I don't know if that answers your question, yeah. but I, I'll lay them all out. And then they still change. I wanted to preach a series that I was forming called Clickbait, um, uh, Beating Temptation. And I've tried to preach that thing for 12 months. I'd hit a hole, I'd go, no, doesn't fit. Hit a hole, no, doesn't fit. Had it planned early in this year, no, doesn't fit. But the beginning of the fall, it fit. But I had already, I had already had four or five different topics around clickbait on beating temptation. And um, so I already had it. And when I looked at my calendar, I had four weeks. So I went, okay, boom, there it sits. If, if I can shape it around months, I, I think people, I think people, that's how I run my life the month of February, mm -hmm. right? February's done. I flipped that page. So I try to either preach series, series that are four weeks um, or, you know, it's six or seven weeks and I have an off week. That's a one off that I give to a staff member or I bring a guest or something like that. You mentioned the pandemic. Um, you know, one of the challenges for preachers is, is navigating through crises. And I don't think any of us were prepared for the crises of this pandemic. Um, how do you think that the pandemic affected you as a preacher, as, as a shepherd, uh, did the pandemic change the tone of your preaching, the subject of your preaching? I know it had to change the mode because you had to go to doing um, a live streaming for, for a few weeks. What did you, how did you deal with that? Well, you know, before, before the pandemic, uh, racial tensions for the last 18 months have been off the chart. Yeah. I think back before that, it was a lot of shootings. Um, I have found that it is, I, I, I don't know if I was fully prepared to pastor in a 24 seven news cycle. That, that probably has been, so think back, how many years ago was it the Sandy Hook shooting? Quite a while. Uh, 12 years ago. Sandy Hook shooting happens and um, I don't even know about it until Saturday. I don't know, maybe that's not true. It seemed like it happened close to, all of it happens on weekends, first of all. Every pastor feels that way. And I never talked about it on Sunday. And I didn't, quite frankly, because I didn't know what to say. Man came up to me after church and said, why didn't you talk about the Sandy Hook shootings? And I said, I didn't know what to say. He said, we could have prayed. I went, yeah, we could have prayed. So that changed me on just because I could, just because I ignore something that took place in the 24 seven cycle. Cause I didn't have the ability to address it emotionally, spiritually, biblically, 
didn't have, didn't have anything for it in 24 hours. I realized that everybody else had heard it and they were expecting me to speak to it. So that's been difficult figuring out what you really should speak to um, and what you shouldn't. But I've never let it drive the preaching. So it might drive worship. It might drive the prayer, the pastoral prayer out of worship. It might drive how I open, but it wasn't going to drive what and how I preach. Now, that doesn't mean that the how, like through the pandemic, there was empathy. We're all, we're all, we're all hurting through this. Um, I did change coming out of the pandemic about um, hope. And, and this really is going to make us stronger and try to address, you know, people's fears. Um, but it turned into a series, not, not a one-off. So I'm not sure if that, that, that answers the question. You, you have to stay engaged with, you know, your people in your community. But if I go off and just decide all I'm going to preach about is social justice or racial justice or the like, um, I'm going to lose a lot of people. I really am. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I get criticized, you know, I'll get criticized for it. You know, why are we still talking about such and such? Um, but, you know, it's someone, uh, someone, I, I, I'm part of a pastoral fellowship here in town with a bunch of pastors and we were together recently and one of them had put a text out that said, trying to encourage all of us is that 70% of pastors um, were looking, are looking for new work now. And they cited the source. I don't know, but that was the text that came out. And there was about, there's about 30 or 40 of us in this text group. And I was the first to respond. And my response was, I went, Oh man, that's going to make it really tough to land another job. And not one of them thought it was funny. I mean, there was like no LOLs, there was no ha ha ha's, there, nothing. So when we were in our, we were in the, we were in the, the lunch on Wednesday, last Wednesday, and I said, I got a question. I mean, like none of you chimed in. I mean, none of you. And they just said I wasn't acting under the anointing. And so <laughs> they left it alone. But, but Dan, it's just, it is hard. And this conversation is one of the things that I've really come to understand in, in, about the way that you have presented this preaching task is that it really is interwoven into the whole life of what you do as a church. Absolutely. That preaching doesn't stand alone. It's not the thing you do on Sunday that you've interwoven the whole preaching task into the whole mission of the church. It, again, it is now it, different people are wired differently. They have different primary gifts you know, I get it. Um, my two seem to be um, shepherding and preaching. And I never thought I would lean into the preaching like I have, because I was always comfortable serving underneath lead pastors. I never once, I mean, yeah, we all don't like our boss some days, right? But I mean, I've never, I never once longed to be the person with the microphone. Never. And so when then I had the microphone, I kind of had to figure out what I was going to do with it. And, and what, I, what I found was it's, where, it's what gives me the most life. And so if it gives me the most life, to your point, that life can't be separated from my call to shepherd. So I had to find how do these two things link. If my primary call is shepherd, and, and, and preacher, which I've always never loved that term because it's a Southeastern, hey, preacher, hey, preacher, you know, I do more than preach. I do more than preach. But quite frankly, over 14 years, I spend more hours per week preparing to preach and to preach and recovering from preaching. Recovering. <laughs> right? From, from anything else. I thought I wanted to plant Gateway because I thought that I wanted to lead an, organiza lead an organization, create it and lead it around one common purpose. And what I found was that has been the most difficult thing to do. 
it takes more life and energy out of me to lead Gateway Franklin than it does to preach to Gateway Franklin. So in order for those not to be separate things, I've got to lead and shepherd through preaching. And I, again, I think that you do a really, really good job of that, better than most. And that's what has always attracted me to your sermons and, and to your ministry. Um, one last question, Charlie. Um, young preachers, they're preaching two or three years. They're here at seminary. What's the number one thing that you would say to encourage young preachers? Well, what I took away from my time um, at Lee and then the seminary um, was how to dig. Uh, freshness doesn't come from any other way than digging. And I'm still, I'm young enough that I should be digital, but I'm still, you know, legal pad note. Uh, my kettles are over there uh, on, my, on my shelf um, because in your devotional time, the wows and what's become the best sermons. So when I read something, I go, wow. Or when I read something, I go, what in the world was that? Those things become the best sermons. I if it so, doesn't, go ahead. I'm so glad you said that because I have said for years that the best preachers are those who have strong devotional lives, that they're reading scripture for themselves. And so when you're reading scripture for yourself and you get to that wow text, that's definitely something we need to share with our congregation. Yeah. And, and I, I have found that I actually started just a Facebook group as much as I hate social media um, around uh, this year, I threw out a book and it was our largest small group. I think there was 80 or 90 people or more in it and I threw out a book and I just asked people to write their wows and what's. And, um, and so, because you can't even get to them all. So I would put a wow, and not every wow and what becomes a sermon, but the, the underlying point I wanna make, Dan, is if it doesn't move me, how can I expect it to move someone else? So, so I've gotta keep working, writing, reading, praying until I'm moved or it's not gonna move anybody else. And when, when I was asked, what was the toughest thing about preaching to an empty room during the pandemic. Um, it was, I had to work harder to ensure that it moved me because there, was, there wasn't gonna be anybody in the room. Literally, when we came back to just preaching online, my worship pastor was there with maybe a, an, a, 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 an acoustic guitar and somebody keeping rhythm um, and one person or two people on the back, one on the soundboard, one on the live stream, that's it. I mean, the room was dark. I couldn't see a chair. In fact, I had to finally ask them to bring the lights up so I could see chairs, so I could pretend I was preaching to somebody. <laughs> um, but I'm telling you, when I look back, it was some of the most effective preaching I've done. And because, I, it, one, there wasn't a lot else I could do. So I practiced. And if it didn't move me, I went right back and started rewriting. Um, so, so that's kind of really my one big thing is, is you've, got to, you've got to stay fresh. Um, the second thing I'd say is you've got to know the room. You, you, you know, um, you spending time with people makes you a better preacher. Exactly. Right? So there's no such thing, well, there is, I guess, but there's no such thing for a pastor anyway than preaching in a vacuum. Exactly. We don't preach in a vacuum. We don't live in a vacuum. So you know, you got to know, you know, know your room. Um, and in this day and time, I would say that you've got to do your very best on let, not let culture drive you. Um, you, you, but you have to address culture. But, but we have to have the, the binoculars turned the correct way, right? So the small end lets you see the furthest thing out clearer. The big end makes the closest thing seem far away. The little end is scripture. Scripture is what magnifies culture. If I do it the other way around, culture diminishes scripture. That's I, can't, I can't ignore it, but I've got to look at it through the right lens. And, and our folks are expecting us to help them navigate that. Um, that is the hardest thing about preaching now. Um, 
I said that, you know, my culture, I mean, my generation, your generation probably had all the pieces to this gospel puzzle. Um, the next generation, um, the pieces were mixed up. Um, today's generation is missing pieces. So I go ahead and tell our people, I'm going to preach as if you don't have all the pieces. So I'm not going to say, you know, the story of Jonah, you know, the story up. And that's the other thing I would encourage. If, if your intent is to reach new people for the, for Christ with the gospel, with the preached word, then you have to preach as if they're in the room. You have to now with, with live streaming, we can already go, okay, well, there's people hopefully watching this not, but I mean, if you if you assume stuff you're miss I think you're missing the boat and I'll have to tell my people from time to time I know it's going to sound elementary I know I've gone over it with you before but I'm not preaching that to you and my commitment to you is if you bring someone from your neighborhood into this church they will not be embarrassed by what I say and how I say it I can't make that promise for everybody I try to make it for my staff but I can't make it for everybody that serves here and everybody leads here because that's a trickle down effect, right? I mean, that's over time. You hope that settles in, but for me, you will not be embarrassed by what I say and how I say it. And we're partners in that. Great. And uh, so Charlie, thank you. I talked a long time about this subject, Dan. So I apologize if I took you. No, no, no. This has been great. This has really been great. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I know that the, the individuals in the class are going to appreciate this conversation. Thank you, Charlie, and God bless you, man. Thank you.